This is Digital Music Trends 138 on the 26th of June 2013. This week a packed show with the Tune Wiki, iTunes Radio, Control, Leakage, Spotify Apps, Eagles, Savna, Amazon Auto Rip, C3S, Pink Floyd vs Pandora, Sony Music Unlimited and Uber Stations. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we chat about and make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. So DMT is available on many platforms so as both audio and a video podcast on iTunes, on most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. And you can email me on andrea at digitalmusictrends.com with any feedback or drop me a line on Twitter. The handle is DigiMusicTrends. And this week I'm really happy to welcome on the show Tom Satchel for the first time on DMT. So Tom works in music and events marketing and has worked for a uh, to music as well as Liverpool Sound City in the past. So hi Tom and great to have you on. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Great. So and uh, then we uh, welcome back uh, uh, our uh, longest standing uh, guest uh, who's been on the show I think nine times uh, so far, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> and it's Darren Hemmings from digital marketing a firm Motive Unknown. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on Darren. How's it going? Good. I'm a bit unnerved by the intro. <laughs> Longest standing. Does that mean I'm going to get fired? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I meant, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Long overdue to be put out for pasture. Darren Hemmings, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, no, that's not what that's that's it. It's good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also, uh, uh, towards the end of the show, uh, at the end of the show, I'm going to uh, add on a short chat that I recorded with uh, Michael Robertson last night on his new startup Uber station. So look out for that at the end of the show. And uh, today uh, we uh, start with uh, uh, sad news, uh, which is uh, the um, closure of the lyrics service uh, TuneWiki. So uh, in a blog post, uh, <laughs> it was announced uh, by the company's uh, CEO, uh, Larry Goldberg, uh, that uh, the service uh, will come to an end of operations starting on June 28th, uh, uh, which is uh, this Friday. Uh, so it's uh, quite a short notice, really, on, on the closure of the service. Uh, the note uh, um, you know, uh, Goldberg wrote in the note that TuneWiki has come a long way from its early days uh, when we pioneered uh, the inclusion of stro- scrolling lyrics uh, into music playback. Over time, we blossomed into a vibrant music, uh, social music service that has been enjoyed by millions of music lovers. Uh, uh, you know, the, and the company uh, was doing, rep- you know, pretty well considering in the sense that you know the the android app uh, android police reported that it was downloaded over 10 million times uh, although the paid app didn't do anywhere near as well it only had about 10,000 downloads for the three dollar paid app on android uh, it had a popular you know ios app it is the number one app on spotify uh, at the moment still and so you know the news came as a bit of a surprise uh, and uh, uh, first of all you know on, on an emotional level, like when you saw this happen, uh, Darren, what, what were your first thoughts and were you surprised as well? Um, I was surprised, I must admit, only because it, you know, particularly I think with the Spotify app, it's kind of emerged as more of the, you know, the, the sort of dominant lyric service that we all know of, you know, matching, uh, you know, lyrics to, to tracks as they go and things like that. So, in some respects, my initial response was like, oh, wow, that's, that's quite surprising because it's by no means the smallest player in that field. You know, it's more or less the, the most well-recognized. Um, if not, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it's technically the biggest because, to be honest, I don't know enough to, to comment. It may be other not services either, yeah. that by going more B2B are, are doing better elsewhere. I don't know. But, right. um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was certainly a surprise. But then when you actually start thinking about it, and it's kind of like, where, where was the money yeah. in all of that? Um, it's not particularly, you know, so with a lot of this stuff, it's been quite hard to find out. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and I, I think it's, it's seeing where the model is and realizing that you can't find it uh, immediately then kind of gives you the answer as to perhaps why this has not succeeded beyond that. And I mean, I've seen mention elsewhere as to, you know, um, t- does this model work as a business to consumer one? And I think that's probably up for debate in, in the wake of TuneWiki going under. Yeah, and the company has been operating since 2007, so I guess, you know, it comes to a point when, you know, uh, six years later, if you can't uh, monetize the service that you have, that you have to call it a day. Uh, and uh, uh, Tom, what's your take on, on, on this? And uh, had you used the TuneWiki in the past? And, uh, uh, you know, what do you think went wrong on, on, on that front? I honestly don't know. Um, up until I saw the, uh, the tweets being headlined, uh, the headlines being tweeted, sorry, uh, I hadn't even heard of it, so you know, just did a, did a quick read and you know, tried to find out you know, where they could have stumbled. You know, I, I, first thing I, look, I looked at was were they, um, you know, in partnership with Spotify? You know, you, you need to be. Uh, found out they were. It just seems hard to understand where the where they've fallen. Um, yeah. 
which obviously with with all the funding they've got, and if if they're not monetizing, which or if you if you can't monetize, it, you know, it seems to be the, the biggest drawback. Like like you say, you know, six years later, if you can't if you if you haven't got anything sustainable yet, then you know it's probably time to close doors. Yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, it, it just seems like a you know a well loved thing. Um, you know, top top ten um, Spotify apps in you know two thousand twelve. There seems to be completely surprising that it's closed down a few months later. Yeah, and it's surprising that it was just a closure that was announced. I mean, you, you would assume when it comes to an app that is relatively successful like this one, uh, there would be a way to offlay uh, at least the company to somebody that would want to buy it. Uh, so it's surprising that they just announced the closure of it uh, rather than announcing an acquisition by somebody else. Uh, and uh, I mean, I guess uh, on the one side, there's a, a bit of a com commoditization of lyrics uh, that is happening at the moment because there are other services like, uh, uh, I think, Shazam, SoundHound, uh, uh, and uh, Pandora has also incorporated lyrics as part of uh, as part of their offering, and so people expect them to see incorporated in other services as well. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's this company like Music Match that uh, appears to be doing really well, and they've uh, just launched a new iPad app, and uh, this seems to be going all, all steam ahead. And they're, they're also having a B two C uh, sort of a. a, a core uh, idea uh, where Lyric Find, for example, has a more B2B uh, API access uh, basis for, for licensing the lyrics to other sites. So uh, I don't know, do, do you think uh, users are coming to expect uh, lyrics to show up in apps that just offer music? And uh, if so, can they be monetized uh, as a standalone feature or do they just have to be a cost that is eaten by a company like Pandora or like Spotify in the future, for example, Darren? Well, I think for me, the, the question is, you know, it comes back to that old thing of like, is it, you know, what's the phrase? Feature, not a company. You yeah. know, where, where the, you know, the, the core offering is ostensibly uh, a good one, but not one that consumers would pay for. And I suppose that question has to be asked of, you know, this kind of service as to whether it's something that would fit a lot better into, you know, the offering of someone like Spotify or whomever, you know, and that potentially it becomes a little bit like, I don't know, Grace Note and things like that, you know, or even Echo Nest to, to, to an extent where it's a, you know, a foundational support to a service but isn't uh, necessarily a sort of consumer-facing service in and of itself. And, yeah. and it seems to me that's probably where TuneWiki got it a little bit wrong. I mean, as I said, the bottom line is I just have no idea how they were making money. Yeah. And the problem with them was it's, you know, as a... Uh, you know, as I said to someone yesterday, it's kind of like, yeah, it was the number one app in the UK on Spotify, but Spotify doesn't make you any money. You know, Spotify makes Spotify yeah. money, but, it, you know, the apps themselves don't directly generate revenue. They can't. I think it's against their terms of service. Yeah, so, I, I also wonder know. whether they were losing money by having uh, this big Spotify presence, because I would assume that they would have had to pay something to publishers uh, for displaying the lyrics on Spotify. Yeah, I mean, and so if they weren't making plausible. any money off it, then they were probably losing money through the Spotify app as well, which uh, is uh, probably not good. And uh, uh, mm. Tom, on, on your on your side, you know, do you think that there is maybe still a missed opportunity when it comes to lyrics? Uh, because uh, you know, for example, I'm thinking about I recently put out. Uh, oh, one of uh, like the DP of my old metal band from when I was in uni back on 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 various uh, services, and I know I did notice that there isn't any space for lyrics when it comes to the distribution. So, if you are uh, you know an unsigned artist or and you're planning to self distribute your 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 songs, uh, there isn't really a way to s easily distribute lyrics together with the music. So, do you find that's something that's missing? Well, for example, uh, from uh, the current digital distribution area as well. Um, yeah, I think it could be really. Uh, you know, going back to vinyl and CD, it's, it's, you you expected to get the lyrics and and artwork within the sleeve. Um, so you know, it's just when we went down to MP3, we stripped everything back, and it was just you know, it's just the files. Um, so it's it's probably things that people are looking for. But like, like Darren said, you know, whether it can stand alone as uh, as a company is a completely different matter. You know, with Pan Pandora already implementing it, uh, Spotify, I'm sure, will jump on board at any moment. But as soon as you type in into Google, um, you know, monetize lyrics, all you get is a load of Yahoo um, queries about how you can monetize YouTube videos, you know, self-made uh, lyric videos on YouTube. Yeah. So, people go, so people go to YouTube to find out the lyrics now as well, because obviously, obviously they're not getting it when they download it through whatever source. Yeah. But um, I, don't, I don't really see the need personally for a, an app on its own. You know, if, if it was there on Spotify, um, as I could listen to the album, 
I, you know, I'd happily have a read through. Yeah. But there's, there's there's no curiosity for me to to download a, a, you know, an app on its own basis to just to just to read lyrics. Yeah, yeah, and and, and certainly uh, Lyric Find uh, has an interesting model because they are licensing the lyrics that they license themselves to you know uh, over a thousand different music sites that display lyrics, and so of course uh, that makes it uh, a more. Uh, uh, a compelling proposition because you know they are able to uh, to sell you know the lyrics that they license uh, and and get uh, more and more companies to put uh, advertising uh, in, next to them and you know monetize them that way. I know that when I spoke to the the CEO of Lyric Find back at South by Southwest, uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, display advertising is still the number one source of revenue for uh, sites that operate uh, on on uh, uh, by displaying lyrics essentially. Uh, and so yeah, that's uh, interesting news. But uh, you know, it's a uh, sad news. I, I met the guys at TuneWiki uh, I meet them um, maybe four years ago or five years ago they had like a tiny booth uh, over there and uh, yeah I've been following the company ever since so uh, a shame to hear uh, that's uh, happening but uh, I wouldn't rule out a last minute acquisition of some uh, of some sort because uh, it just seems weird that uh, the company would just uh, disappear like that uh, and moving on I wanted to uh, talk uh, quickly about uh, iTunes radio because it was an interesting article on Evolver FM by Elliot von Buskirk uh, that was summing up essentially what is happening at the indie level on iTunes Radio. So, um, yeah. Digital Music News uh, reported last week that it had confirmation of Apple sending out a pre-filled inferior contract terms to independent labels for iTunes Radio inclusion. Uh, still, um, even though Merlin uh, is not directly involved in uh, most of the negotiations as the deals with Apple uh, predate the formation of the organization uh, uh, for many of, of the members of Merlin, uh, Merlin's CEO Charles Caldas uh, told Evolver that he would be surprised if Apple uh, was to discriminate against independent uh, labels at this juncture uh, because the company has a good history and and uh, with within the independent sector of, of treating them fairly so uh, you know there's a lot of there was a lot of emphasis in the in the press last week about the uh, big three uh, labels uh, major label signing uh, but then Apple didn't actually announce uh, those particular deals uh, during the event. They just mentioned that the service would be launching. So you can't really blame Apple for putting the focus on the majors on that particular front because it didn't actually uh, put that focus in the spotlight at the at the announcement. Uh, uh, you know, and at the same time, uh, Apple does have an alternative if they can't uh, get a deal done with the labels directly. They could go th via the compulsory licensing route uh, via Sound Exchange and via ASCAP and BMI in the US. Although that would re really restrict the way that they can use uh, the music uh, as part of the radio. So it's, it's quite a complicated uh, uh, scenario, of course, because there's hundreds of labels that Apple has to get deals uh, done with in order to launch uh, properly for uh, for iTunes radio. But uh, Tom, do you feel like uh, you know you agree with uh, uh, Charles Caldas uh, in terms of Apple uh, not having anything to gain by discriminating in the labels and offering them inferior contracts? Uh, completely, especially when in um, in regards to Merlin, you know. Um, you look back, and you know Spotify went out of its way to integrate Merlin with with the majors in in its its own licensing deals. So it just seems odd that Merlin's been left out um, at this point. You no, know, but maybe like like he said in his own statement, um, maybe they were just overlooked due to um, iTunes predating the formation of Merlin. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 as far as I know, iTunes um, for MP3 sales, it, it it pays everybody the same amount. Um, you know, everybody gets the same same cut, whether you're major or an indie. So it just it seems odd now that now that iTunes are launching its own streaming service for them to start um, discriminating against uh, independent labels. Absolutely. So um, you know, Merlin and you know larger indie um, label collectives. You know, they're, they're probably going to get well. I, I'd Im imagine um, a fairer deal, you know, probably similar to the majors. But I reckon. Uh, you know the, sm the smaller indies through distributors like like Ditto Music and TuneCore and everything, yeah. um, probably going to be sim seeing similar deals that they've, they've already receiving from Spotify and Pandora. Yeah, and there's nothing to say that beggars and the like uh, haven't signed already. I mean, it's just the fact that when the deals are done with major labels, there's so many people involved that usually the news leaks uh, before anything is announced. Uh, uh, Darren, do, do you feel like uh, Apple uh, has been fair to the independent sector so far, and so wouldn't have anything to gain by discriminating against it? Yeah, I mean, certainly historically, it seems to have been a fairly egalitarian setup, although yeah. they're very different worlds, aren't they, as regards what happens when you get played on the radio versus, you know, the money you see when you uh, sell a download. So yeah. I suspect they're two very different conversations. I think what's been bothering me a little bit around this whole debate is that I, I'm just not entirely sure that the facts are out there. Yeah. It seems like 
there's, you know, as you said, we, you, we don't know that deals aren't being done and that conversations aren't being had. So it's only because someone kind of said, oh, well, the, you know, the three majors are on board. Um, you know, and there's been very little kind of clarification beyond that as to what conversations are being had, where and with whom. Now, I think, you know, it's a, there's been a natural element within business to, to try and kind of shaft the indies a little bit because they're the smaller man. And, and it's, you know, it, it's just the nature of business that if people can work over the smaller man to get, you know, a better deal, then they'll they'll have a good go. But history's kind of proven equally that, particularly via things like Merlin and now that, you know, indies hold quite notable kind of artists on their side, that um, ignoring them is, is sort of perilous, you know. So, yeah. but I, I just feel more than anything like we're, we're not getting the full picture on this. I, 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 it sort of annoys me intensely when really shitty blogs like Digital Music News start writing kind of two and two equals five stories um, without yeah. a full grasp of the facts. And, you know, it, it, that that's not the basis for a story really you know it's uh i think may, maybe there's something in there but i just think it's kind of very easy to paint the industry as like oh with dinosaurs and apple are evil and all these kinds of things and that you know there's no smoke without fire this stuff does happen and you know and i saw it firsthand where you know apple would try and use its kind of business clout and it's you know it's it's uh dominance in the marketplace to dictate terms and things but that's like, that's not really an Apple thing. That's just a business thing, and it does happen. It's not yeah. nice, but it's just a fact of, of, of business, really, generally. It's how the world works. But to sort of jump into this view that, you know, particularly that people like Digital Music News are presenting of sort of Merlin as being, you know, idiots and being very sort of, you know, conservative and backward in their views and all that stuff, I just think is ridiculous. And, you know, my experience has always been that the indies generally are – very tough to fight their corner, but they're very savvy. They're very on it. And, yeah. you know, across the board, they're a sharp bunch. And we should give them all and Merlin a bit more credit in this area because history has sort of shown that Merlin's actually been relatively good. Not necessarily perfect, but they're by no means the kind of simpering buffoons that certain blogs would like them to be painted as. So yeah. <laughs> I think we need to cut them a bit of slack. And when we know the full facts, then maybe there's an argument and, you know, a case to answer here. But at the moment, I just don't think, I, I just, my gut feeling is we're not, we don't know. I think there's probably conversations afoot, but we, we don't know with whom and, and you know, where yeah. in that discussion where we are. Going. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's uh, an interesting story. We'll, we'll definitely uh, look out for any actual facts coming out of that in the next few weeks. Uh, and I wanted to go back to what we talked about last week, actually. Uh, we talked about uh, the uh, Jay-Z uh, and Samsung deal. Uh, and there was an interesting article by uh, Zach O'Malley uh, from Forbes, uh, uh, which looked at this uh, Jay-Z release and the Kanye West release. Uh, and uh, uh, he suggests uh, an interesting point, which is that uh, Jay-Z has, has essentially been paid $5 million dollars uh, to leak his own record, uh, something that would have probably happened anyway, like it happened with uh, with Kanye. Uh, but uh, the only difference is that Kanye didn't get the five millions from it. So, uh, w what do you guys think about that? Can uh, the giveaway by Samsung be compared to a pre-release uh, leak? And uh, do you think, in that vein, are we going to see more of these? And do you think it's a business savvy proposition for for major artists to do because you know they kind of have to resign themselves to the fact that once they start distributing the record to uh, digital stores, uh, unless they have like a ridiculous embargo in place. Uh, uh, the record is going to leak uh, at least you know two or three days before release. Uh, Tom, what's your take? Um, I thought it was an interesting article at first. Um, you know, I, I didn't consider it that way. I didn't consider it a leak. I just thought it was, you know, it was, it was a business partnership. Um, you know, we can't, as, as a major artist, it, you can't hurt Jay Z. He's already, you know, he's, he's already considered a commercially successful artist. So, you know, he's, he's part, partnered with brands before, so it's not it's not something out of the norm for him. Sure. Um, so, you know. If he's all he's all he's done is take control back. You know, if if it was going to leak, you know, it might have done. We don't know, but all he's done is take control of the situation, and he's he's done really well out of it. Um, you know, whether Kanye's kicking himself for not doing the same thing is you know, we don't know. But um, you know, it's it's not something that's entirely new. You know, we, I know we're going to talk about BitTorrent later, but you know, uh, Public Enemy and um, Counting Crows, you know, a few people have um, partnered with, with different sites to, you know, not to essentially leak it, but to distribute it in different in a different way yeah. um, for free. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's just a different way of doing it. But Jay Z's just made sure he's, he's been paid for it. Yeah, uh, Darren, do you think it's it's comparable to a leak? And do you think uh, at this point, you know, it's going to happen anyway? You might as well uh, 
monetize it and and make sure that fans don't want to get it i think everyone's getting a bit sort of drunk on the nomenclature around this it's kind of whether it's a leak whether it's an exclusive is a bit you know you're talking about <laughs> get, getting stuff maybe ahead of its official touchdown date through one means or another yeah so kind of you know whether it's a like a paid leak is that's an exclusive isn't it that's not a leak, <laughs> exactly. a leak is yeah. like you didn't plan it the leak is we had no idea someone else has taken our record and put it out. Yeah, so the yeah, notion yeah. of like it being a paid leak is a bit, a bit weird, frankly. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Know, it's sort of a paradox. <laughs> it makes sense. But um, true. yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. That whole debate, I think it's, uh, it kind of, you know, I, I, I talked about this on, on, you know, with the, the Daily Digest. I've written a few bits about it. And uh, David Emery at Beggars kind of wrote a blog post as a consequence of that. That, that was really good, you know, and, and I suspect you might have mentioned it last week, but, you know, it's worth a read um, on his no, site. No, I don't think he was out when we recorded it. So. Oh, right, okay. So, you know, and, and he was sort of saying, you know, at what point are you kind of selling out and going too far? Because his view was really, I think, that, that this felt like a, a step too far. And, I mean, it's funny with David because me and him often disagree on stuff but then realise that, or I certainly realise he might disagree again, that, uh, you know, you meet sort of somewhere in the middle, really. Uh, you know, his view is that this is probably a, a step too far. My view is that, you know, as Tom said, it's kind of like for Jay-Z, he's done so much stuff around brands and there's so much kind of entrenched business as, a, as an element of your culture within hip-hop that, you know, it's, it just doesn't seem that weird to me. You know, the notion that he's done this, I don't, I don't think his fans would be sat there going, oh my God, he's done what? But equally, like if Radiohead did it, then, you know, you would know full well that fans would be absolutely up in arms. Yeah. So, you know, it's complicated. There's never a kind of cut and dried element to this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you can do it and you can get away with it, which I think Jay-Z can, then why not? You know what I mean? It's a great way to, to monetize. You know, you're, you're basically selling like a million or whatever records kind of up front and getting the cash straight in your pocket. So, yeah. you know tricky one but um yeah as for this kind of notion of it being like a paid leak that's a bit that's a bit it's weird you know by the same yeah. notion that's like daft punk did a, a leak to apple for a week before release and like <laughs> where does this you know old j did a, a soundcloud leak a week before their album came out yeah where, where does it stop you know it's that's a bit weird it's it's just we're playing i guess, with I guess it's now. just a, a it's just a question of controlling the source of where that stuff comes out from I guess that's it, that's it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, you know, you, you, but you know, everyone likes to think that they do control the source. Because I guess it's and easier. They, they most do, you know. Yeah, because I guess it's easier. You know, if you, if you start if you start streaming your album on iTunes a week before release, uh, than thinking about it from a digital release perspective, then uh, you could actually only start sending the album to all the other stores, you know, the day after you start the the streaming on iTunes, and so that means that, you know. Even if you did have a leak from one of those stores, which you know there's hundreds in the world, it's very hard to control uh, what happens with the files after you send them. Then it means that at least that people have a one place where they know that they, they, they can get it anyway and, and listen to it anyway, and uh, and they're less interested in in the leak itself. That's I guess yeah, that's the only I, benefit. I think really this to me boils down to you know giving you know trying to understand what fans want and when yeah. and then balancing that against you know the potential revenue to be drawn from that and whether it uh, whether it's going to piss the fans off you know yeah. if you sit there and go oh, you know someone's going to pay me 10 million quid to shoot my cd to the moon and leave it there for a week before release <laughs> i'll do that you know what i mean and that's <laughs> not very wise but like you know with the jay-z samsung thing it's funny cuz like that you know there's a lot of people using samsung devices and it's funny because I, I may be off on it, but I think you know a lot of music industry people use Apple's and you know and iPhones as products. And it's kind of the people I saw grumbling hardest about this. I would stake a lot of money on owning an iPhone, and sometimes that can make you a bit myopic as to the the broader deal of like the man in the street. And I think you know Samsung are selling an absolute ton of these things. Yeah. You know, and they're free to Samsung device owners. Have you seen how many Samsung devices are out there? There's about thirty. You know, everyone thinks it's like one handset. There's not. There's like a raft of these things. So there's a huge potential reach. Yeah. And it, you know, and I, and I just think, to be honest, you know, as I said, in, in hip-hop generally, it's kind of, you know, if you haven't launched like a clothing line and a vodka brand, then you're clearly not doing very well. So in that world, kind of releasing stuff, you know, in advance to Samsung owners is kind of de rigueur. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's to be expected. And I just think other fans will wait. And you know what? If someone leaks it, 
and then it winds up all over peer to peer as a result, then maybe that's the that's the backlash and that's the indication that maybe you did go a bit too far with this one and you should reconsider in future, you know, because it yeah. could be that it does leak and everyone rushes in, you know, in their bid to get it because it's locked out for non Samsung device owners, you know, that that then it gets downloaded a load of times and doesn't get sales, you know, yeah. things like that. So we'll we'll see. But I think I have to say actually another part of this that I think hasn't really had much debate yet is is the degree to which his option to use Samsung within you know his campaign will potentially damage his his chances of getting kind of love from iTunes, for example, and things like that. Like to what extent would other retailers get behind this, knowing that he's yeah. taken it to certainly in the case of Apple, like a the number one kind of competitor at the moment, you know. And I, I, my gut feeling is that I suspect iTunes will just sort of man up and and put it on a brick on the front because they know that it is guaranteed to sell an absolute ton of stuff. So only a only a fool would ignore it. It's a business yeah. transaction at the end of the day. But even so, that that's sort of something I've not seen much mention of. Is like to what extent has that exclusivity damaged his relationship with other retailers? Yeah. Absolutely, that's quite interesting. And uh, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit, uh, going back to the TuneWiki uh, Spotify uh, uh, sort of uh, app idea, because there was an interesting uh, blog post by Alison Lamb from uh, Believe uh, on the Medium blog this week. And uh, she was talking about uh, how uh, Spotify apps can increase listeners uh, for a specific artists and, and tracks that are involved in some of those app releases by up to 400%. And so she, she mentions a classical label uh, X5, for example, that saw their play, plays shoot up uh, 412% for the release of the great, 50 greatest uh, pieces of classical music when they released the app Classify on the service. And that also led to a 50% increase in digital sales on iTunes. And the, the ERA Metalizer app generated 23,000 playlists in the first day. Uh, Blue Notes app, which was developed uh, by the EMI Sandbox project, has also been very successful. And SoundDrop, uh, which is an actual startup rather than a label-funded app, uh, is also doing very well uh, with with uh, uh, you know thousands of listening rooms and and uh, a lot of activity on there. So uh, and so here's the thought. You know, is the value in the Spotify apps purely to drive plays and increase revenues for for the music, uh, or is there a potential business model be beyond that? And and uh, of course, you know that's a question that people are asking them themselves as labels have to invest money in building these apps, uh, as startups are looking at whether it's worth uh, having an app on Spotify or not, and whether that helps their business or not. And uh, uh, and of course, uh, startups that are uh, wanting to build their whole business on or start their business on the Spotify ecosystem, that becomes pretty pretty hard. And uh, we've seen the the app called uh, I think it was Tunigo that it got acquired by, by Spotify in the end, uh, which uh, was, I guess, one way of, of making money out of this model. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting ecosystem. And of course, the fact that there is more, more and more apps being released, and there isn't much of an organization yet on the on the system as to how you discover those uh, makes makes it a, a much more noisy environment. It makes it harder to discover, and so the investment becomes less and less justifiable unless you have really the marketing push to push these apps. So I don't know, uh, Tom. Tom, what's your take on all this? It's it's quite a complicated subject, but I think it's worth bringing up because you know it's we're now in this almost in July of this year, and we haven't seen any major update to the app ecosystem on Spotify since. Uh, uh, they made their big announcement last December that they would overhaul the client. Um, I don't know. It's, it's not one that I know too much about. Um, you know, from what, what I know, the business model is you know you, you pay to get your app on, you, you can't monetize. But from what I've seen um, of a few blog, blog posts about trying to, trying to monetize apps that use Spotify, is that they're all saying just use it as a lead back to your primary site. Whether that's you know that's obviously not. Um, the number one solution and people are obviously looking elsewhere but you know we have seen as all the apps if, if apps are driving um you know for, for, for further streams and you know for, for discovery and you know personally some of the apps that are on there is what uh, drove me to actually join spotify in the first place yeah. and I'm sure, I'm sure that's probably the same for a lot of people you know it's, it's, the, it's the addition uh, the addition of, of these you know of, of things like sound drop and uh, we, we, we are we were hunted we are hunted, we are hunted um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I use both of those um, and enjoy them both you know, immensely. But if if they can't monetize, then it's it's pretty gonna difficult. Be, yeah, it's going to get a bit a bit difficult for them to you know, like we saw with um, Tune Wiki, they're just going to stop fall off the radar a little bit. Yeah, 
Uh, Darren, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Because, of course, you know, it must be something that you sometimes consider, I guess, uh, working with bands and thinking about how best to do their digital marketing. That's uh, Spotify is a huge platform. And on the other side, you know, there's, there's the apps and there's also, you know, the artist pages, which are now, in a way, sort of vying for attention over the apps because people can follow artists through the artist page. How, how, how does that balance work as well? I mean, I think the... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few bits to get through there, isn't there? I mean, the, the apps, I think, you know, good apps work. It's as simple as that, really. Um, I think there's there's been some great apps um, and there's been some really shitty ones as well, you know, and they, uh, you know, but the, the best ones rise to the top, which, uh, you know, in terms of adoption and usage, I think works. But as Tom sort of touched on, and as we sort of said earlier, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it can monetize. I do... I do I worry slightly that there's, you know, we've seen a, a lot of mud flying in Twitter's kind of ecosystem around this notion of like, get people to build stuff based upon your platform, and then at the point at which it is most convenient for you, shut them down, um, you know, or you know, find means to, you know, turn off the fire hose so that their access is crippled, or you know, you change the agenda somewhat, and my gut feeling is that Spotify probably aren't going to do that, but again. You never know, you know, and, and it's, uh, I mean, I sincerely hope they won't. But, the, you know what I mean? There's been, yeah. there's just been a few things like this along the way now elsewhere where history's kind of taught us that they, you know, sort of sit there and go, here's a, you know, here's a lovely area for you guys to go play in. Go forth, play. And everyone goes and plays. And then they, you know, when they reach a certain level, they sort of start saying, oh, hang on, we'll, we'll pull that back and we'll do that. Yeah. A bit like we're seeing with Facebook kind of aping Vine, you know, with the Instagram video features. Sure. It's like you have to find a way of making this work better and, and integrating it to your own setup. So I think with the apps, it's, uh, it's tricky because, you know, I've seen other people talking about this, you know, relative to their websites where, you know, it's great that someone like Pitchfork or the NME have an app on there, but what does that do to their actual revenues? Because if people are using the app more where they can't serve ads and can't, monetized then actually it's detracting from their core business which is their own website where they've got complete control to kind of run ad inventory and everything else so yeah. it's certainly tricky in that respect i think you know spotify as a, as a client is just that you know they they absolutely clear as day have some kind of mega update looming that will pull all of this into sharp focus yeah. and if you look all of the little signs are there. You know, even Daniel X saying the other day that he's got this dream where there can be location-based music recommendations and everything. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, the guy does happen to run like the world's, you know, one of the world's sort of biggest or certainly best-known music streaming services. So you can bet your bottom dollar that they're going to be looking at that being some kind of function to come. Yep. You know, you're standing near London, you want to see what everyone else around you is listening to, stuff like that. So there's a whole load of things coming. And, you know, the app integration, I think, will be a part of that where you'll see more of it across mobile. But generally, I just think the best stuff will float to the top. I think it's, you know, there are some really, really good apps on there that are very complementary to Spotify's kind of core offering. Yep. And as I said, there's a, there's a few others that really just are a bit sort of, you know, dross. They're not yep. that great. Yeah, exactly. um, I mean, I think it, it can help. I always question, like I saw, I read Alison's piece and, you know, I know Alison, she's, she's a very sharp lady, but, you know, as soon as I read pieces where people quote percentages in growth and stuff like that, I'm, I immediately get the kind of cynicism, klaxon sounding because, you know, 400% growth in plays could be from like 100 to 400, you know, without slightly harder numbers to back this up, it's... Yeah. complex it's it's uh, it's a tricky area complex at best yeah sure yeah and uh, uh i this is just a, a mention because uh, it seems like every week I, i'm thinking whether i should establish a drinking game on the show although it, it, it we're recording in the morning uh when we talk about spotify hold on. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> there should be more drinking on the show i think uh, i don't totally. enough on it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um and uh, the Eagles uh, have uh, also abandoned, you know, their, their streaming holdout, and uh, their entire catalog is now available on uh, all streaming platforms from yesterday. So this is a uh, uh, fairly big news because the Eagles are one of the biggest bands in the U.S. You know, they're 
the last record in 2007 sold, sold a gazillion records in the States. So uh, definitely big news. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, following Pink Floyd uh, uh, last week. And so uh, I wonder what's going to happen next week and whether we're going to be able to drink uh, something next week if uh, somebody else ends their holdout against Spotify. Uh, but that's essentially just a service news because there's not much commentary to do on that. It's just bands realizing that they can make money on, on Spotify and Ardio and Deezer and uh, uh, getting on the bandwagon essentially. And uh, um, I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, sort of more gaming related matters because there's a couple of interesting stories coming out of uh, uh, Sony, Sony and uh, uh, Xbox. So uh, both platforms uh, have been uh, trying to get a position in the music market. You know, Sony has got their Sony Musical Limited, which is cross device, uh, works across all, all Sony devices, and they also have uh, uh, in outside iOS, uh, outside OS ap applications as well. Uh, and Xbox Music has also been trying really hard to gain a piece of the market uh, in that sense since they launched the last year. So starting with Sony Music Unlimited, uh, you know, they, they are adding pieces to the puzzle. You know, they drop their prices ex uh, like uh, incredibly uh, uh from what the competitors are proposing. So I think that it's like a 50, 40, 50% discount if you get a yearly subscription to uh, Sony Music Unlimited over what you'd pay, you'd pay for a year for Spotify or, or Audio. Uh, and they also launched the uh, caching for their uh, iOS application, so that makes them a lot closer to their competitors on, on that front. Uh, you know, it remains to be seen how well they advertise all this and, and whether people are actually going to uh, go back to the Sony Musical Limited application after perhaps uh, trying it out and figuring that it had a lot less features last year than uh, uh, comparably uh, RDO or Spotify or Deezer. Uh, I, I don't know, first of all, uh, you know, Tom, do you feel like uh, Sony Music Limited has got a chance of uh, resurging uh, thanks to all these new things and the fact that Sony is potentially taking also a, a, a loss on, on the yearly subscription for, for the music as well? Um, yeah, I think possibly it's, it's a possibility. You know, offline playback is the next thing, I, I'd say, with streaming. Um, yeah. you know, until you've got 100% access, there's always going to be a downside with streaming. Um, so, you know, with, with Sony bringing that in, it's... It's ahead of the game, I suppose. Uh, you know, obviously, with a few different streaming services, you can take off a few playlists. But until that's a hundred percent, it's it's always going to be a downside. You know, that's why I'll I'll always have my iPod on me because I won't always have three G or, or Wi Fi anywhere. So you know, I want I want my music when I want it, not when I've got Wi Fi. Yeah, um, so it's if it's if it's something that can, yeah, if, if it's something that people are interested in, you know, it's, it it can only help them. Yeah, and, and Darren, I, I was at the Sony Music Unlimited launch press release conference. It was, I think it was two years ago at Medem. And since then, you know, the service is, is huge. It's, it keeps launching in new countries, but uh, we don't really know much about the level of subscriptions. Do you think that stuff like this and maybe the PS4 launch, which is going to bring focus back onto Sony, and it, it seems to be having really good PR, is going gonna, is gonna to bring the music uh, offering back into focus? I don't know. Like, I, I quite like it too. I mean, I used to work at Sony, so I sort of feel a twisted sense of allegiance, even though, uh, frankly, I didn't leave under a particularly good circumstances. So <laughs> it's more of a battered wife relationship on reflection. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they're, um, they're I mean, they're, they're a funny bunch, right? Because they're, you know, they, they, they had it all there for the taking at the turn of the century. Bearing in mind, you know, even then they were trying to, uh, I forget. I mean, it's, ch it's changed names so many times, but, you know, they had a music service then. But the problem was that they were so obsessed with trying to restrain everyone to being purely within the Sony ecosystem that, you know, everyone jumped ship because it was kind of like, well, you can only, you know, you can only use our music service on a, on a, on a Sony device and then the devices weren't much cop. And, you know, they, it was a similar tactic to Apple, you know, but Apple obviously worked because they made the devices amazing, whereas Sony's were merely functional. Yeah. And, it, and it's sort of weird because you think with all of the things that they have with the PlayStation and, you know, they've got Sony Music as you know, the, the label, as it were, they've got the services, you know, they've got the whole electronics division as well. The TVs, you know, they've, yeah. They've got, yeah, they've got the potential to sort of connect it up, but they just seem to have got, they, they really sort of descended at some point into this kind of terribly corporate environment where they just sort of, it feels like they lost sight of, of the consumer really and what the consumer yeah. wanted something i thought though that has been a very interesting kind of indicator was that they've um on a couple of areas now they've shown a sort of uh determination to try and embrace like hackers and and a slightly more kind of go-to attitude so they've had this smartwatch that they've built that everyone 
kind of crucified for just having like poor design and generally not really being like the best um, you know product. And so they've kind of now thrown it open and just said to developers like do, you know do your best like do, you know do whatever you want to do build it and let's see what we can make here. And I like that. I think that's a very wise attitude now to show that they're a bit more keen to listen to what people want because, you know, at the end of the day, while some developers can veer too much into geeky world, as you sometimes see at sort of music hack days and things, there are also others who will build incredible new features that should be adopted by these kinds of products. Yeah. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a signal that potentially they might be getting more into a, into a place where they do embrace what people are saying to them and, and don't just try and shut the front doors and do everything internally and feel like they know best. And yeah. if that was applied to the music service, then it, it, you know, it, it may work. I just think at the moment you're now seeing, you know, I mean, God, if you go back two years, you know, there were only about three players in the streaming music services market, yeah. particularly outside the US. Now, I mean, you know, everyone's doing it. It's, it, you know, it's between, you know, Google have entered the fray, Microsoft, you know, all of these people are weighing in and, and it's really, really hotting up. So in that, there, you know, Sony, if Sony had done this two years ago, they could have made a difference. Yeah, now they've got to work much, much harder because there's just so many people in that space. And right, right now, I'd say the Sony brand is pretty tainted, you know, and, the, it, it, you know, there's, there's a reason that people like the, what's the name, Daniel, whatever it is, the, the, uh, the investor, you know, who's calling for them to spin off the entertainment division into its own kind of um, entity, you know, to keep it sharp, you know, yeah. all of that stuff, whilst absolutely true, doesn't help the Sony brand, which is continuing to be painted as a little bit out of touch. Are there still people that do worse? Uh, for example, if you look at uh, Xbox... <laughs> <laughs> I, I would yeah. love to know what the numbers are uh, if you if you compare Xbox Music to Sony Music Unlimited, because Xbox Music has been completely locked down uh, since release uh, uh, around a year ago. I think uh, you know it's only available on the Xbox 360, Windows 8, and Windows Phone 8. And so uh, Tom Warren at the Verge actually this week uh, wrote an article saying that Xbox Music is going to launch a web-based version of the service. Uh, it will be apparently announced next week, although it won't launch next week. Uh, but again, it feels like way too little, way too late. I mean, there's no iOS or Android app, which is uh, the primary way where uh, how people are consuming their music these days. And uh, I just don't understand how people could justify paying a subscription for uh, something that just sits in the living room or if they happen to have a Windows 8 phone. Uh, you know, even if you can access access it through a desktop computer now with the web-based access, it's still it's still not enough to justify a subscription. Uh, but what do you guys feel about it? I'll go first. Then. Um, yeah. It just seems like after E3, Xbox are just in in bad shape. It looks like <laughs> um, obviously it's, it's probably been a long time coming the the web-based version, but. Like, like you say, you know, with such a limited possibility of actually using a paid subscription, uh, and there's no draw, no draw to it. Um, you know, I, I haven't got a Windows phone. I've got an Xbox, but I'm not just going to sit and listen to music on uh, sit and listen to music on my Xbox. I'll, I'll have my laptop if I'm if I'm on my Xbox. It's fine. You know, yeah. I've, I've got other places I can listen to music. I don't have a Windows phone, so um, it just yeah, like you said, it just seems too little, too late. They're not. It's not broad enough to um, justify paying a subscription for it. Darren? Yeah, what yeah. he said. What he said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it wasn't really a, st a story to comment on. It was just kind of like, what, no, what I mean, the it's hell? A, like. But it's, it's, you know, you see it across the board. You get a lot of these very token entries. It reminds me of when Tesco started a download store. You know, it's yeah. very just like, oh, we're going to do this because someone else is. And it was a really half assed entry into that area, you know, that just showed a complete lack of understanding of the marketplace. And, and what people really wanted and all those sorts of things. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a funny one because you, th you think on paper, like, Xbox would have a chance of capturing those kids that are gaming. Those kids that are gaming don't spend money on music, yeah. you know, particularly when you've got a YouTube app on your Xbox and that's what kids use to listen to music. You're immediately fighting that, and it's, it's just weird. It's kind of tokenistic, and there's a bit of it where you feel like, look, either do it properly or just bugger off, you know, because you... Absolutely. you, you you sort of come in, you're going, well, we, we've got a music thing, but what are you really delivering there? You know, and at the moment, in the face of the likes of Spotify or 
you know, even the kind of superior, you know, interface experiences you get, things like audio and that, they just, they don't really stack up. So it's, yeah. it's a funny one. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to uh, finish with a few bits of news from around the world because, uh, of course, we are trying to keep an eye on uh, everything that's happening, which is uh, kind of hard, but, you know, <laughs> that's how we try to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a few uh, bits of uh, world news uh, that are quite interesting this week. So uh, first stop is in Germany, uh, where I wanted to mention that uh, uh, apparently uh, the site golem. They reported yesterday that Amazon will be launching its auto rip service uh, in Germany after coming to an agreement with GEMA uh, as well as uh, with majors and uh, hundreds of independents. So the service will be available on a broad range of recordings, around half a million. And an, an Amazon spokesperson said they were excited about the launch because uh, uh, whilst in the US uh, physical has become a minority of the music market, in Germany it's more like 80% of the market, sorry, uh, physical uh, is more like 80% of uh, the market. And so it'll be interesting to see how people adopt uh, the additional cloud offering from Amazon. And so uh, Autorip, of course, if you haven't heard of it, allows users to access physical uh, the physical CDs they purchase from Amazon uh, from the cloud music service without uh, having to rip them and upload them. So uh, that's a story to keep an eye on just because it's been interesting to see whether the adoption, uh, I think Amazon is going gonna to be so potentially surprised by the adoption rates of that you know, in a primarily physical market and so that's interesting. And staying on Germany, uh, the service uh, C3S, uh, well the, the company C3S which is a Creative Commons backed project uh, that is aiming to become an alternative collection society in Germany and across Europe uh, is, uh, is going to launch a crowdfunding campaign next month uh, to allow to, to, to allow it to take uh, some first steps towards becoming that entity. Uh, so the campaign wants to roll 3,000 members that are each going to pay 50 euros. Uh, the goal is to raise 150,000 euros in total, a third of which will be used to set up the company and uh, uh, 100,000 euros will be used for the technical development of the society's back end. So we all know how difficult it must be to try and set up a society from scratch considering how many things have to be uh, tracked and considered and, and divided and stuff. Uh, so uh, but take a look at the C3S website. I'm going to uh, throw the links in the show notes and if you're interested you can check out uh, when their crowdfunding starts and also check out the one-to-one -one show episode 5 that I recorded with uh, uh, Wolfgang Senges who's one of the founders uh, um, uh, a couple of months ago I think. Uh, guys, any any thoughts on either of those stories in terms of uh, uh, Gamer actually doing a deal with Amazon, which is interesting, and uh, uh, you know, a potential for an alternative to Gamer in Germany. I think it would be interesting. That, you know, I mean, that's the problem now, isn't it? Is Gamer are just so, you know, I mean, they're, they're just the the albatross around most people's necks in Germany. You know, it feels like even artists don't want to support Gamer anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's such a strange thing, and it's a massive pain in the neck relative to you know, video premieres on YouTube and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's so, yeah, there's, you know, they're, they're, they've got to be one of the most hated organizations out there, I would have thought. Yeah. If you were to, you know, per capita in Germany, Absolutely. I would have thought yeah. more people loathe them than do the RIAA in the US, you know. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'm amazed they've done the deal with Amazon, but, but equally good, you know, all power to them. I think it's great because, as you said, there's a hell of a lot of physical products sold there. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. But it's no shock to see someone trying to set up an alternative to Gamma because, but you know, just the very fact that that has come about says a terrible amount about how Gamma are per per perceived. You know, it's yeah. um, it's, a, it's just a they shame. They have a terrible PR as well. Like that, they need well, to I hire mean, their PR, PR couldn't too. get any worse, could no, it? Exactly, I just yeah. they've hit like the absolute zero point where PR is concerned. No one could think worse of them. You know, yeah. they're just dreadful, and so you know. And I think it's it's just a shame that it's come to that. I mean, how many years are we into this YouTube Gemma dispute? And I, and I understand it's complicated, and I understand that um, you know both sides have uh, arguments there, and people are playing hardball and all that kind of stuff. I get it, but you've just reached this point where, like, whatever the deal is, it it, it will struggle to kind of compensate against what's been lost yeah. to date by way of this. Kind of gratuitous deadlock, and I think that's uh, that's just a shame. You know, it's, exactly. it's it reflects badly on all involved, and it's it's lousy. So, and um, it's uh, it's difficult for me to understand it, especially following the conversation I had with the CEO of SASM. Uh, who was talking about how happy they are of the deal they managed to reach with YouTube. And SASM has always been a fairly, you know, hardcore society to deal with when it came to to making deals. So if SASM are happy with the deal they made with YouTube, 
you know, I'm I'm surprised that Gamer haven't managed to come some to some sort of agreement with the, with well, the company. I as think well. the the Gamer thing now is kind of in this farcical point where Gamer won't even sit at the table because yeah. YouTube they're saying YouTube are demanding that they uh, sign NDAs around the whole discussion before they even sit down. So you're now in this like ridiculous scenario where they're arguing about even meeting up to talk about the actual argument. Yeah. You know, they just need the bloody heads knocking together. It's it's yeah. it's Totally ridiculous. And, and so. on some points, like, I know Sassim were very, very strict about not having NDAs on the rates. And, and you know, I think they won that battle. So, you know, there, I think that there, are, there are points where YouTube is willing to, to give way if there is stuff that can be done. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens with that. And uh, also moving on to a couple of uh, news coming from uh, Asia. Uh, so first of all, uh, the uh, digital music market is set for more growth in India, uh, where the music service Savna, which is uh, the leading service for Bollywood and South Asian content, has struck a deal with uh, uh, Tata Docomo, which is one of India's largest mobile operators. And uh, the subscribers will have access to Savna's catalog of 1.1 million songs uh, via special stream anywhere data plan uh, with no Wi-Fi necessary. So uh, there's going to be three different plans. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, that particular network has a very large portion of uh, uh, the, the younger demographic, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens on that front and whether that uh, gets people to convert into 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 subscribing for music. And of course, the prices are uh, uh, sensitive to the market and to what people are uh, willing to pay over there. So, uh, interesting development, and I'm looking forward to see what happens there. And also uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, um, alternative markets uh, in the Middle East, uh, the company Angami has reached two million downloads. Uh, so they've only been around. For for a year and they cover the Middle Eastern and North African markets by focusing on local catalog, although they also have deals with the majors. Uh, you know, they have a Spotify-like model. Uh, they, they're number one in a number of uh, territories as uh, on, on the iTunes uh, app store, uh, um, for example, Saudi Arabia. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. And you can actually uh, try Angami yourself. Uh, it's restricted to the local content that they have from, from, from the Middle East. They don't have international content for if you access it uh, from the US or from the UK, but you can go and download uh, the Angami app. It's quite a nice experience and you can discover uh, some uh, uh, cool and random Middle Eastern music if you do that. So a couple of interesting news from Asia on that front. And guys, I wanted to end today by talking about Pandora. I mean, we talked about it so much last week that I feel like we're beating like no, I don't know, something, uh, but uh, a record in terms of like covering something week after week after week. But this uh, news that keeps cropping up about Pandora and it just, it just won't stop. Uh, it seems like really we're at a turning point where the company needs to start thinking about whether uh, being so open with their opinions on, uh, well, not with their opinions, but being so, you know, uh, confrontational with the industry is, is becoming a hindrance for them rather than a benefit. And so uh, Pink Floyd uh, published an op-ed uh, on uh, an editorial on USA Today that uh, was signed by Roger Waters, David Gilmore, and Nick, Nick Mason. And uh, they essentially make the point that they're not happy with the fact that Pandora has been um, writing to artists, asking them to write to Congress in support of internet radio uh, uh, when uh, they don't mention anywhere that they're actually uh, um, backing a bill that would essentially cut uh, artist royalties by 85%. So essentially, they're just asking for transparency. They are being relatively sensible, like reasonable, saying that you know they understand that there are issues and that people should talk and maybe there are things that can be changed, or rates could be lowered, maybe perhaps, or you know, there might be ways that the two sides can, can come together. But uh, you know, this sort of campaign where Pandora is trying to recruit artists to uh, to help them make a point with Congress is not good in their view, and so and so that's just one of many different uh, points of views that I've come across this week on Pandora's issues and how people feel about them, and it's really starting to polarize the industry quite a bit. And I think uh, uh, from a PR perspective, it's definitely uh, uh, falling into 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 the you know music industry's favor right now uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, you know the press is concerned, I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, Darren, uh, do you have any particular feelings towards this story? I, I know you haven't been on the show for a few weeks uh, since uh, uh, Pandora has really gone, gone <laughs> I mad. I get to do the, the, the four-week ranting catch-up. Yeah, no, exactly. Because I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, the last four weeks has really been full-on for Pandora in terms of actually... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it. a funny one, isn't it? You sort of reach this point where like, I saw Jason Herskovitz tweeting the other day saying, you know, Pandora really need to fire their PR agency now. You know, <laughs> they've got a serious brand problem going, and I think that's that's very true. Like their name is is just being dragged through the mud. 
um, and it, 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 it looks terrible, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of reaching that point where it's just embarrassing, you know, and it's kind of yeah. like, that needs to stop, but I think it's really, it's, it is tricky, I mean, I think it's easy to demonise Pandora on this one, but, you know, I did see a good point made somewhere else that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there is something a, a little bit ridiculous about the notion that playing a song involves different monies, you know, depending on where you hear it. Like if you heard it on the radio, then the artist is paid this much. And if you yeah. hear it on an online radio, they're not paid that much. If you heard it because you chose to play on Spotify, then you, they're paid this much. And it's like that conceptually is a bit weird when you think about it. It doesn't, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. But equally, you know, it is a continual bugbear of mine around startups particularly ones that claim to be, you know, use awful terms like being disruptive, where, you know, there's, there is a, a threshold at which point, you know, quite simply, if the argument is that your suppliers have to drop their rates in order for your business to be viable, then your business model clearly isn't very well plotted out. Yeah. You know, and, and this sort of, you do see this a lot with startups who go, well, you know, if we'd have got everything for free, we could have made money. And it's like, Yes, but that's a shitty business model. You know, that doesn't work for the people supplying to you. Yeah. And that kind of basically applies to Pandora, you know, this kind of immediate response of we have to drop the rates, you know, uh, otherwise the business doesn't work. It's kind of like they say that like it's anyone's problem. You know, if the business doesn't work and it goes under, well, then you wind up like TuneWiki. Yeah. And it's just, it doesn't, you know, it, it, your, your business was never going to survive. So I think it is complicated, but I think, what the Pink Floyd thing shone a light on, which was particularly embarrassing for Pandora, was the slightly underhand and duplicitous way in which they're, they are sending these letters to artists saying, you know, please support us, we get you loads of plays, you know, without really being particularly clear on the, 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 the true agenda there. That's, you know, quite aside for, you know, the, the argument itself is one thing and that's quite complicated and and I accept that that's got layers to it and it's, it's problematic. But kind of being caught with your pants down, sending these things to, to people and making these demands, particularly when it's like Pink Floyd. Like they just got called out by Roger Waters, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's embarrassing. Like when was the last time Pink Floyd issued a statement about anything? It was like Live Earth or whatever it was, you know, Live Eight. So, you know, short of global poverty and hunger, this has actually prompted the oldest rock dinosaurs to come out and give you a firm kicking. Yeah. So, you know, Definitely. in that respect, you know, they, my God, they really hit a low point when, when Pink Floyd away. And you, you know, what next, yeah. Bono? It's terrible. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Tom, any, any thoughts on that? And uh, do you feel like looking at this, uh, I, I was asking actually one of the guys last week that hadn't really been following the story a lot, but, you know, he, he really felt like the, the balance was shifting towards the public being more sympathetic with artists, uh, even though they love Pandora, because uh, you know so many hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of millions of people, use it in the states. Yeah, I completely agree with pretty much everything Darren just said. You know, it is a PR nightmare. Um, you know, and it, the whole you know e doing mass mail outs. Uh, for, you know, they're doing it. Apparently, they're doing it from you know different employees within the company, um, trying to make it personal, I suppose. But you know, it, what I saw was a, apparently a quote from the email saying, and the, and they used the word exposure. I don't think anything will piss off artists more when it comes down to talk about royalties than the streaming service talking about exposure. So I don't see how that's <laughs> going to get anybody on board. Um, you know, they're, they're just not right. helping themselves at all. Um, you know, the, the, the number of, you know, things that they've, they've tried to do, you know, with, with buying that um, terrestrial radio station, you know, they're, they're just, they're doing one thing, but then telling the ice, you know, um, we're, do, we're doing this for our benefit, but can you support us, please? It's, it's never going to work. Yeah. Um, I just what would, would not like to be in in the, their PR team, like you said. It's a <laughs> <Yeah>. nightmare. <laughs> it's it's a nightmare, and and uh, I think this is the fact that they're just taking all of this head on, and like uh, the fact that they when they bought that terrestrial station, they put a blog post out detailing exactly why they were doing it and accusing ASCAP of uh, of driving them to do this and you know being a pain essentially and all that. And I'm sure, like I don't know, uh, it comes to a point where it's, it's probably better to continue having closed doors conversations than to putting it out there for the whole world to uh, complaining about what's happening. And I don't know, it just seems like. <laughs> yeah, it feels like the, the, the whole strategy to it is just ropey as hell, isn't it? You know, yeah. and, you know as Tom yeah. says, it's kind of, it's, it's that point where, you know, like the, the whole radio station buying thing was just, you know, so clearly a ploy to, to you know, to make a move to, 
sort of force the rates down that, you know, on the one hand, they're like, we love you, we love you, buy the station. You know, yeah. it just... It's, it's awful, yeah. And really it, it was actually like, a, it's a good, uh, business-wise, it's a good idea and it's perfectly legitimate if they can get it through. I mean, people do it with, you know, I heard people comment that people do it with tax all the time. They use loopholes in order to to pay lower tax. And, you know, if that's something that they wanted to do and try as a business, there's no harm in doing that. But the fact that they did it and then they flaunted it in, uh, in the industry's face <laughs> in, a, in a very open blog post, you know, I'm sure they could have done all of this uh, pretty much behind closed doors applied for the for the lower rate maybe it would have come out in the press but it wouldn't have been quite so front page as it was so uh, yeah an interesting strategy anyway we'll see we'll see how, how, how it works out for them and uh, i think we're going to do another show i definitely uh, show it's, it's been an hour or so sorry uh, guys i kept you i kept you a long time today uh, but uh, uh, if you're listening stay tuned uh, uh, right after we finish here it's going to be uh, the uh, short interview with michael robertson and his new uh, radio startup uh, in the meantime guys if you have anything that you want to plug or any project that you're working on or artists or anything like that please uh, go ahead uh, uh, darren i'll start with you uh, anything you're on <laughs> um, yeah, you know you have to have this, this ready by now you know it's uh, i know i know it's coming I, um uh working with uh oh dear god uh so eliza and the bear new band are working with just uh yeah. unveiled their new single friends which is brilliant look that up really really good songs zane lowe has been playing it and raving about it uh spring offensive another new band i'm working with who are really good uh right. i've just um put out a new single speak that's equally brilliant so go and look that up um yeah oh a new label i work with houndstooth as well who are fabrics mm. new label and they've got an amazing set of artists there they seem to be uh, rating like the highest set of reviews for their opening kind of four or five releases for anyone I've ever worked with, where they've all had like four out of five, nine out of ten, stuff like that. So uh, Rob Booth, the A&R man there, is absolutely killing it. But they've got a new band called Snow Ghosts. They're well worth looking up. It's a busy time at it's the moment. Time. There's a lot going on. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> So I, I, would, I, would, I would tell people that are listening, you know, if you, if you need anything, you know, go email Darren. It's probably not, not a good thing to do. I'm just sitting around here. I've got, like, time on my hands. He's got time on his hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Tom, any, any project you're on? Uh, well, just continue with the, you know, with the Beats on Toast posts. Um, yeah. that, that, you know, they try and come out monthly, as I do. That's beatsontoast.com? Beatsontoast.wordpress.com. Great. Um, but then as well as that, um, establishing a, a new PR company um, with a few um, friends that, that have studied journalism. So that's called Fortitude Press, um, well, Fortitude PR, sorry. Um, but at the minute, we're, we're building a site for that, you know, um, building our client list in, in a few negotiations, luckily, at the minute, uh, and just building, building up the, um, the mailing list. So that's Great. something that I'm pretty excited about, but it's, it's a slow process, but we're getting there. Awesome, that's cool. Well, thanks so much, guys, for coming on the show. And now, as promised at the start of the show, my interview with Michael Robertson. So it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show today uh, Michael Robertson. So hi, Michael, and uh, great to have you on. How's it going? It's going great, Andrea. Thanks for having me on your show. That's great. Well, uh, you know, I had you back uh, in 2010. Uh, we're talking about MP3 uh, tunes at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, it's great to have you back uh, talking about your new project, uh, which is called Uber Station. So uh, tell me all about it. First of all, uh, what is it about? Uber Stations is an online radio service. I think my, my premise is that there's been a tremendous investment in on-demand music. And I'm thinking, yeah. you know, Spotify, RDO, Rhapsody, et cetera. But consumers are saying what they want is radio. Yeah. And you, you can see that by looking at the monstrous numbers of users and, and hours of listening that companies it's like Pandora and TuneIn have, which absolutely um, dwarf the numbers for all the interactive music services. So my point is, users are saying they want radio. The industry has been hyper-focused on on-demand music services. So my idea was, hey, let, let's go focus on the interactive music side, I mean, the, the uh, online radio side of things, and see how we can improve prove that business because I think it hasn't had a lot of investment in it. And so I think there's some really interesting ways that we can greatly improve that consumer experience. So that's what we've been working on. 
Yeah, and, and it's an interesting uh, idea, of course, to be able to scan the ra radio stations and to be able to provide that information in real time to consumers. And so, uh, sort of, how do you go about doing that? And of course, it's a, quite a big undertaking given the number of radio stations that are uh, around in the U.S. alone. Right. So let me tell you what we're doing at Uber Stations. We just uh, announced this service, and there's three really innovative things that we're doing. Um, the first is we're tracking in real time what stations are playing. Yeah. Uh, and this is both songs and talk shows. R remember back when TV didn't have a guide? There was no interactive guide. And you would have to turn on the TV and it was, you know, who knows what it was. And you'd go through the channels one by one looking yeah. for something to listen to, I mean, to watch, you know, and you wouldn't stop because maybe there's something better three channels ahead. Well, that's kind of how radio is today. You turn it on and it, whatever's on is on and you don't really have any insights into what is playing. Well, what we're doing now is tracking the songs and the shows that are playing on thousands of stations. So when you go to Uber stations, we're going to display a list of all the radio stations near you that you're probably familiar with. These are AM, yeah. FM stations that are near you. But we're going to show you the songs that they're playing and the shows that they're playing. So that's innovation number one. Innovation number two is we figured out a way to stream AAC streams into a browser. Yeah. Uh, about half of the radio stations that are online that are streaming are streaming in AAC form format. And while MP3 streams really easy into a flash player, AAC does not. Yeah. And so we figured out a way to do that. What this means for the user is that at Uber stations, you can click between stations and all of them play in one uniform uh, interface. That's great. This is really this is really unique. I mean, how a TV works, right? You don't yeah. have to go to a totally different um, uh, uh, viewer uh, design every time you go to a station. But that's yeah. how radio still works. So that's the second thing that we're doing that's very innovative. The third thing is that. Because we're tracking the songs that are on and the shows that are on thousands of stations, when you're listening to a station, we've built in a recommendation engine that says, oh, you're listening to uh, you know, Maroon 5. Great. Well, here's 20 other stations that also play Maroon 5 songs. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening to an NPR show, All Things Considered, we say, oh, here's 10 other NPR shows that are on the radio right now one click away. So we've built a recommendation engine around radio that uses the radio programmer as the intelligence en engine. Right. So where Pandora uses the music genome trying to describe every song's characteristics, we're using the playlist that uh, a, a radio station manager plays. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so in terms of uh, looking at uh, how the pr product is going to be deployed as well, uh, do you have uh, ideas as to... Uh, you know how you're gonna move forward with it because of course you know it's a project that right now is concentrated on the United States but there's a lot of applications uh, that can be can be seen uh, worldwide and so uh, technically how do you feel the rollout is going to be in terms of actually being able to uh, successfully track all of the stations in in the US and then uh, subsequently move into international uh, programming as well right uh, um, well it's, it's a big technical job there's a reason Nobody uh, tracks what's playing in real time on radio stations today, and it's, it's a very complex job. There's a lot of radio stations and different formats and different ways they, they make that content available or not. Yeah. And so we started focusing on the U.S., but we're quickly ramping up to include international stations as well. We launched last week... Uh, a web version of our service, Uber Stations. Right. So uh, you can go to it. It's great on desktops. It's great on tablets. Uh, we, we just uh, yesterday made a mobile version. So it looks okay on mobile. It doesn't work as, as slickly as a native app, but it's still right. usable. Um, but I think adding to uh, international is, is very important to us. And also figuring out how do you combine net stations with AM, FM? Right now, the way Uber Stations works is when you start up the app, we look at either your uh, uh, 
IP address or your latitude, longitude location and use that to find stations near you. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense for AM, FM because you probably know the stations that are in your, your uh, region. Yeah. But net stations don't really have a location, you know? I mean, where is the absolute stations or SOMA? You know, just because I happen to broadcast out of San Francisco, SOMA is not a San Francisco, uh, you know, radio station. Yeah. So how do you blend to, we don't know the answer to that, but that's something we got to figure out because, you know, we, we want to combine net and, you know, traditional AMF from radio operators into one comprehensive experience and we don't know how to do that yet so yeah. if you have an idea andrea <laughs> let us know <laughs> <laughs> that's great well uh thank you so much for your time it's a really interesting uh, uh startup and really looking forward to see how well it's going to go it's at uh, uberstations.com and everybody can uh, check it out i'll uh, throw the links in the show notes as well and uh best of luck with it it sounds like uh, you got your hands full so Great. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, and I'm serious about if you have input or any of your listeners, feel free to drop me email, uh, michael at dar.fm. I read everything. I take it to heart. And so if you've got input, don't hesitate to send it my way. That's great. Thank you. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, DMT is available on a variety of channels, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, visit digitalmusictrends.com and check out the DMT one to one show, which has interviews with uh, uh, startups and uh, companies working in the uh, music uh, digital marketing space. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a great week. Until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.